a message your neighbor first or yourself. In the me, me society that we live in today, it's real easy to say, I always put my neighbor first. But the proof is in what we end up doing, how we act, how we treat our fellow person, fellow man, fellow woman. And, and it's easy, you know, I, 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 I thought of as I was writing this letter, this message, I thought about things that, that uh, sometimes I get aggravated about and it consumes me. And when it consumes me, am I really putting my neighbor first? One of the things that I'm really having a hard time with right now is the immigration thing. I really have a hard time with the immigration because I want to love everybody. I want to reach out to everybody. I want to do what's right. But I don't want to be taken advantage of. But sometimes, even in God's Word, we're going to be taken advantage of. God expects us, I believe, to be taken advantage of sometimes. To cross that line. So that's hard for me as a person to do because I get up every morning and put my pants on and go to work. I get up every day, except for this week, instead of you chiming in. I go out there and I work hard and I do the things that need to be done to provide for my family. And then I look at the verse that says that if you don't work, you don't eat. And, and I... And I think about that verse, and, and that's where my wheels are turning. How far do I take that? How far do I take it? Do I not help somebody that's not working because they're lazy? Because we know a lot of them. We know a lot of people that not only is it lazy, it's reciprocal. It's it's the way they've been taught. It's what they do. How do we break that mold? And the only way that we will ever break that mold is with love. And sometimes it's hard to love. And I'm being honest. Sometimes it's, but right. And I agree with you there. I agree that there's tough love too. But sometimes it's hard <coughs> to even get to the tough love. Sometimes we take the tough love first. Is that what you understand what I'm saying? I try my best not to take the tough love first. I try my best to continue to love and love and love. And even when I come up with the tough love and I tell them, I still give in some. I still back up and help again. Over and over we're told to put our neighbor before ourselves. Do we? Do we really put our neighbor ahead of ourselves? Do we put them ahead of ourselves at the sacrifice of our own family? Sometimes we do. But does God require us to put our neighbor above ourselves over and over and over. I, I, I talk often about the, my pastor growing up that lost his family, okay? He lost his family. Now, there were more issues, but the, the degree that, that his family saw what perception's reality was he put church ahead of his family in every aspect and he's got three kids okay and one two three four five six grandkids and I don't know how many great grandkids he's got now but only one daughter, and I think two grandchildren are serving God. And also, besides that, beyond that, 
was he turned his ministry over to his son, who's really not even a practicing Christian, if he even professes Christianity because it was his eldest son. How far do we take? No. I'm just telling you, how far do we try to draw people in, draw people in, draw people in to force them to accept Christ? Force them to do the right thing? You know, we, there's got to be a number. Who is your neighbor? I've already said it. We've gone too far. There's a difference in helping and enabling. There's a difference in helping and promoting. You know, we can help people. We can help them, help them, help them. But, but what do we do? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And this was what I shared a little bit this morning in Sunday school. I also see the, the, the flip side of it where us... I want to use the right words. Dogmatic, legalistic, me too, me only, me, only one right preachers take portions of Scripture and they make blanket statements and they hurt people with their blanket statements. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, and I didn't write it all down. I didn't read it. I, I didn't even look it all up. I mean, I looked it all up, but I didn't write it. Or do we not know that unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God and now and will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't do not be but deceived. And what that's talking about is immorality and sexual perversions and and drunkenness and, and all these different things. And, and and we're taking this and we're making blanket statements, and it's not presenting love when we make these blanket statements. Because the very, it, it, it talks about, you know, they're, they're beating up the homosexuals. Am I against homosexuality? Yes. Okay? Do I think it's a sin? Yes. But am I going to stand in the pulpit over and over and over and over and over and beat someone up because they're homosexual? Debbie brought up this morning that the church that my sister's going to, a couple joined the church, they weren't married, they kicked them out of the church. Bam, bam, bam. What do you do? You gotta love people. You got to love people. You gotta love your neighbor. And when you start practicing, I'm better than you, I'm holier than you, the holier than thou attitude, you might as well shut the doors. Because the very next verse, number 11 of 1 Corinthians 6, says, And such so were you. What that saying is, is you've made the same mistakes as other people in the world. We've all sinned. <laughs> we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And if we've all sinned, quit beating somebody up because they sin. Because it's only by God's grace that you're not going to do it again tomorrow. David this morning. Dave, uh, Ron was talking about David this morning. David was a sinner. Abraham was a sinner. Noah was a sinner. Rahab was a sinner. Every hero of the faith that's mentioned was a sinner. Paul killed Christians. That's what he did. He killed Christians because they didn't agree with him. Let's quit killing by beating up and let's start loving. Let's not judge but love. <coughs> I got one, Lisa. I just had to open it. Thank you. No, I, I'm I'm not going to preach the whole time. 
I'm losing my voice. Thank you, though. Are you, not, are you strong enough to please your neighbor? Are you strong enough to stick your neck out there to help your neighbor? That's what it's trying to tell you. Are you really strong enough? <laughs> We're not here to please ourselves. We're not here to be the one that I'm it. Now we who are strong ought, ought to bear the weakness of those without strength, not just to please ourselves. If you're a strong Christian and you have a friend, an acquaintance, someone you meet on the street corner that's going through something and you talk to them and they say, well, I'm a Christian. You don't say, well, you're living on the street. What, why, why do you think that's happening? You, you know, you pick them up, you take them to dinner, you take them to eat, you share with them, and then you take them back to where you found them or take them to a warm place to sleep that night. But you don't beat them up just because they're not living at the same standard you are. That's almost like a person that lives their life wealthy and cannot associate with someone else. I used to say, <coughs> I still say, a pastor, a full-time pastor, should not be the person that's paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars more than the average person in his pew. Why? Because you cannot associate with somebody. The other hand is, is you don't need to pay your pastor, and I'm happy, don't anybody misunderstand this. You don't pay your pastor penance and expect him to be able to associate with Ron. I had to pick you, to pick on you a little bit. You don't do that. But we all have our degrees of, well, they just don't fit in. They're not part of us. They stink. I still get aggravated about that. They stink. Believe me, I've been locked in that room with some of them. You got to love people. Each of us is to please the neighbor for the good of his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. We please our neighbor. Are you strong? Can you step up for others? Is your faith strong enough? Can you lift them up? Can you pull them up out of the hole? Think about it. Can you pull your neighbor up? Can you pull a person that is struggling up? Using God's Word. Maybe using your wallet. Or you just want to beat them up. You know, I, I had to think about this a lot this week. Especially laying at home or sitting at home or sleeping at home, or whatever you want to call it. I have to think about it a lot. Because I always want to help. But what I don't want to do is enable. And there's a difference in helping and enabling. For Christ Himself did not please Himself. Think about it. The very Son of God didn't do what He wanted to do. He did what was good for others. Think about that. The Bible says He didn't have a rock to lay His head on. He had a rock to lay His head on. The reproaches of those, for, but it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on Him. In other words, the things that were going wrong, the the negativity, the things that, that uh, were always being said or done or, or the, the things that, 
that went wrong didn't go was was the disciples fault was disciples fault but who got blamed for it Jesus who gets blamed for things now the church the church gets blamed because we can't feed everybody in America the church gets blamed because we hate LBGs or LBGTs or whatever they're called. The church can't, the church does everything wrong because, well, they should know my circumstances. I can't afford this, this, or this. They shouldn't kick me out of church. Well, the church is wrong a lot of times. We have to love people. We have to practice love. For whatever is, was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Think about it. That's not just talking about the New Testament, which we like to hang on to, but that verse that I just quoted was from the Old Testament. I think it was De Deuteronomy. We, we follow Scripture. This is what I wrote here. But verse 4 talks about earlier times, the instruction that was given to us. In earlier times, we're fortunate enough to have the New Testament also. And, and I put... <coughs> so here's the Scripture out of the New Testament. All Scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correctness, for training in righteousness. It doesn't say some Scripture. It says all Scripture. All Scripture means Old Testament and New Testament. It was written for reproof. It's reproof. Beating me up. Getting me back on track. Beating you up. Getting you back on track. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. The first one was, was profitable for teaching. It's all for teaching. But it's for reproof, for correction, for training. We all need to learn more. How many times have you heard me say, don't, Believe it because the preacher said it. Believe it because the Bible said it. The only way you're going to know that is if you study it. That's the only way. For correction, for training, in righteousness. We're supposed to live a righteous life. What is righteousness? It's not perfection. Christ was the only righteous. He's made us righteous... Okay? We are righteous. We're His righteous children. We are, say it right, sinless in God's eyes because the, we're covered by the blood. But does that make us sinless? We all make mistakes every day. So we need to remember that we make those mistakes and still practice love. Number two, <laughs> be like-minded with one. Be like-minded with one voice to the glory of God. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus so that you that with one accord you may with one voice glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ what's that say what's verse 5 say to me what it really said was we need to pray for unity we really need to pray that God gives us the perseverance and encouragement, okay? 
and he grants it to you in the same mind with one another. We need to pray over and over and over that I'm not better, that, that I love, that I love the unlovable, and I want unity. That's what we need to pray. Verse 6, keeping the goal of a Christian, of Christian unity. You know, just because I don't agree with somebody does not mean that I can never associate with them. The best boss I ever had in my life was an alcoholic. I still call that boss two, three times a year just to check on him. You know, the last time I talked to him, you know what the first thing he said to me was? Bobby, I've started going to church. I've, I've, I've started listening. I've started reading my Bible. Okay? Now, what if I've never, ever, ever, ever reached out and loved him? He tells me, thanks for loving me. Thanks for checking on me. You're the only one. I haven't seen him in, well, we went to see him, what, 20 years ago? We went to see him 20 years ago. But I've been gone from Pitney Bowes for 27 years. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for checking on me. We're going to have to get together. I'm, I'm thinking about coming to Tennessee. Can I come see you? Yes, Terry, you can come and you can stay with me. Love people. Keep standing encouragement. What's encouragement? You've got to keep pushing people. And I'm bad. I'm bad about pushing. I'll, I'll admit. Because I get focused on something and I start pushing and I push and I push. Sometimes I push too hard. Sometimes I don't push far enough. I mean, it's, it's hard to find that blend. But encouragement translates to push also. Yeah. So, but what, what I'm getting at is sometimes I don't push enough. Sometimes I push too much. Sometimes I just throw my hands up. Because what? You know, I talked about an individual this morning that, that over and over and over we've talked to, we've helped, we've done this and this and this and this and this. And he does fine as long as he's in your sight. But as soon as he gets out of your sight, he messes up again. What do you do when that keeps happening? It's, it's a lifestyle. It's something that was he learned with one accord and one voice. Our unity must be real and apparent. You can't be in a shell. You can't just live in a shell. You know, sometimes I find myself just backing up and what's the use anymore? That's being in a shell. You have to continue to love. Not to please others, but to, per, to please God. And as you please God, others will follow. And as you glorify God, the Father, God and Father, I, I've never seen this before, but it says, in one accord you may with one voice glorify God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, there's just the Trinity and just that one little bitty verse. God the Father, uh, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not... Uh, it's, it's not adopted, but it's the Trinity. I don't know what I put there. I can't read my writing. I can read it. I, 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 can, I read it, but I don't remember why I put that. I'm sorry. Accept as Christ. Accept as us. Accept you. Therefore, accept one another. 
just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God the Father. Did you get that? Accept one another. Love one another. Reach out to one another. Show others that you love them because God first loved you. Just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on the behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and to the Gentiles. What's that? For I say Christ has become a servant. We're to become servants. That's something that's, that's not accepted in today's culture. You expect me to bow down to that person? No, it's not bowing down. It's submitting to. We're supposed to be servants to everybody. We're supposed to be servants to our church congregation. We're supposed to be servants to our family. We're supposed to be servants to the people that don't love us. Now, there's a stopping point, I believe. But if you never try it, you'll never reach it. You know, I don't want to be walked on. But sometimes servants were walked on. Jesus was spit on. But yet, I'm too good to be spit on. That's our attitude. That's our mentality. We are to be servants. <coughs> Except one another's uh, one who is weak. Oh, I know. This this verse, verse seven, referred back to uh, chapter fourteen, verse one. It says, "Except the one who is weak, weak, uh, who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on on his opinions." Don't don't just because someone's weak. Just because someone's not as well studied, just because you've got money in the bank and they don't, we're supposed to love one another, the weaker person. And we're not supposed to pass judgment on that person. But what do we do? We do. We do do it. Self subconsciously sometimes. Sometimes we do it on purpose. We've got to love people. As Christ accepted us, if the, if the sinless Son of God can accept us, sinful as we are, we should not hold back, but we should accept. It's only by the grace of God that I'm standing here. It's only by the grace of God that I've got the job that I've got. It's only by the grace of God I've got the home that I live in. It's only by the grace of God that I got the car that I've got. Yeah, I worked. I worked. But I could have ended up with the same failures of so many other people. God is who put me where I'm at. And God will keep me where I'm at until He decides to make me a servant. Servant. Or he calls me home. But use what God has given you to help others. That's what God tells us to do over and over and over. Matthew 10, 24 says we come, and this was a cross reference, we come to the cross on equal terms according to God. Think about it. I didn't come to the cross because my parents <coughs> raised me in church. I didn't come to the church because my parents were financial contributors to the church. I didn't come to the cross for any other reason except for Christ invited me to the cross and I got the same invitation that you did and you did and you did and you did. Same invitation. 
So therefore, I'm not any better than you are. I'm just blessed. And we have to accept that, that we're blessed. But God brought us there, and we all get there the same way. It's sort of like, what I, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were talking, I guess, I put my pants on just like everybody else does. One leg at a time. If I feel real bad, I put it on two legs at a time. Okay? But I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you do and you do and you do. I put my shirt on the same way you do. I might put my right arm in before, and you put your left arm in. I have to put my right arm in because I can't get my left arm in if I put my right in, if I put my left in first. I can't get my other one in. So, it's all the same. I tie my shoes the same way. If you tie it off. My daddy started wearing Velcro. The next was about circumcision. What was the importance of circumcision? It was a covenant. It was a rule. It was a path. The Jews. The Jews were the circumcised. And it was a part of identification with God. Okay? That was the I believe the first identification point with the Jews. It was the first thing because it happened with Abraham. Okay? But later in Scripture, and actually in this chapter, circumcision had gone over to the Gentiles. So no longer was it just for the Jews, it became part of an identification with the Gentiles. Now, they may have done it for a little bit of different reason. I don't know. Maybe they did it because Paul was stressing it. You know, maybe that's why they did it. But, but what's common today in today's world among young males? Circumcision. Or it might not be as common as it used to be, but it is a common thing. It's hmm, pretty much. It's, a, it's an identification. Um, Jesus was born a Jew and had the physical sign of a Jew, so he was circumcised. The sign of the covenant. The promise of the Father, it's, it was a covenant promise. It was a Jewish requirement a law, but also a God requirement in the Old Testament. It was something, and then as Gentiles accepted Christ, and as they were taught, they were circumcised. It's, it's sort of like to me about baptism today. Okay? Baptism. I was raised, you couldn't join a church without being baptized. I was raised that, and, and I'm talking raised as in not just as a child, but for 40 years. For 40 years. That if you was a Christian, you had to be baptized by immersion. That was the only way to be baptized. If you were a Christian and you didn't follow Jesus in baptism, you wasn't a Christian. I mean, all this junk over and over and over. I believe it's important to be baptized. Do not take that away from me. I believe it's an outward expression of an inward experience. Baptized with Jesus in baptism into death, raised to walk in newness of life. Okay? I believe that 100% with all my heart and soul. But I'm not going to demand that a person be baptized because they're not ready. Because if you baptize someone that's not ready, all you're doing is putting them under the water. Because they'll never understand it. They'll never. And, 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 and you know what? Do you know what then they'll say 10 years down the road? You'll ask somebody, are you a Christian? They won't say, yeah, I got saved here and this is what God's done for me and blah, 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 blah. You know what they'll say? 
I've been baptized. Right? Baptism is important. Baptism helps you grow. But I do not believe that it is a, it is a requirement for salvation. Ashley got saved and, and uh, was two, three, four years before she was ever baptized. What if I said, you got to be baptized today? Would that have done more harm than good? Would that be putting the wrong thing, wrong message out there? Verse 9, Gentiles glorify. God extended His grace <coughs> outside of the covenant. He came unto His own, His own received Him not. God did extend that grace. I'm going to stop. i got two more slides. But I'm going to stop. It's 12 o'clock. Please understand that, that my message is love. We have to love. I'm really I'm really tired of the hate gospel. I, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it to a point that, that I want to sometimes disassociate myself from those people. But then if I disassociate myself from those people, how will I have an opportunity to share the truth of the gospel? We have to love all people. And y'all just got to warm up. I mean, y'all know this. Everybody in here knows that I preach that over and over and over about love. So pray for me. Uh, I've got some, some decisions to make with some of my pastor friends. Some of my people, I mean, I, I've, I've said it over and over and over, but this, this stuff, just like the, the thing that I told you this morning about the, uh, the governor inauguration, Billy professes to be a Christian. And I believe he is. Okay? But he is being torn to pieces by the Tennessee Pastors Network. Okay? I mean... I, I, that's that's where I'm at, Sam. That's where I'm at. I, I keep getting invitations to do these things and do this and do this and do this. And and this is sort of like the last straw this week because when we teach hate, when we present hate, the world sees it. And when the world sees it, we're doing nothing for the cause of Christ. Even my buddy, Travis, I can't remember Travis's last name. Even my buddy, Travis, that tore me apart for the first six months that I was preaching and then tore Wayne apart and then jumped back on me back and forth. He is even going against the hate. We are supposed to love even the unlovable. I'm supposed to love the abortionist. I'm not so supposed to support them, but I'm supposed to love them. I'm supposed to love the Muslim. I'm supposed to support them, but I'm supposed to love them. You'll never reach them. Shala, uh, Sha, can't even think of his name. The one that got saved, the pastor, the the Muslim pre, the Muslim guy that got saved that was sent to America to kill Christians. Okay. Yeah, and that's who, you know who I'm talking about. Do you remember what happened 
how he was led to the Lord. He was in an accident, automobile accident, here by himself. The, hosp the doctor wrote off his hospital bill. The guy had nowhere to go, and the doctor opened his doors for him to live and showed him love. And he said, man, you don't understand. I hate Christians. That's okay. I love you. I love you. And he showed him so much love, God's love, that he became a Christian. And now he goes nation. And, and he's has death threats all the time. But he goes nationwide sharing God's love. That's what we're supposed to do. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving us. Father, I ask more than anything else, as we're Christians, if there's someone here that's not Christian, that we present the gospel in love. Father, it's not about what you have to give up. It's about what you want to change. I've never had to give up anything. Even though there was a list of rules. God, everything that I needed to remove from my life, you removed it. I didn't have to. And you gave me something better. But Father, until we start preaching love and practicing love and, and sharing love with everybody that we meet, we're just going to be failures. So as we go forth, help us to love one another. It's in your Son's name. Amen.